Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Jean Marie Roddy. I uh, just joined the Vascular Surgery Division at MUSC uh, earlier this year. And I'd like to thank the um, administrators of the SCT conference for asking me to give a talk this morning. And I'm going to present a case of endovascular management of aortoiliac occlusive disease. So uh, patient MB is a 71-year-old white female who uh, presented with severe lifestyle-limiting claudication. Uh, she had had to stop working as a nurse uh, case manager because of the severity of her claudication. And she had stopped smoking uh, two months prior to her clinic visit with me. Her past medical history is significant for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and uh, carotid stenosis. Her only past surgical history is a C-section. And she's currently medically managed on aspirin and statin, as well as uh, some blood pressure and uh, diabetic medications as listed there. On physical exam, she had regular rate and rhythm, no palpable femoral pulses, um, and she had monophasic signals in her dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial. Her ABIs had been completed at her outside uh, vascular surgeon's office and uh, showed significant um, uh, ischemia at 0.41 and 0.48. Um, I apologize, I wasn't able to load the entire uh, axial images from her outside CT scan, but you can see she essentially, oops, she has um, pretty, you know, relatively normal appearing aorta um, in the inframenal segment to the distal aorta where she becomes severely narrowed and occludes, and then bol uh, bilateral common iliac arteries are occluded. She did reconstitute at her distal common, or excuse me, distal common iliac and her uh, external iliac was without disease, but she did have significant disease in her common femoral artery, uh, demonstrating she actually had two, uh, two levels of significant stenosis and occlusion. So um, having reviewed the images, um, I uh, talked with the patient at length about open versus endovascular options to deal with her um, aorto and iliac occlusion. Uh, this was a very energetic patient who was really eager to getting back to work as soon as possible and uh, was very active with her family activities. Um, and after, after uh, discussing all the risks and benefits, we agreed to uh, pursue an endovascular repair of her uh, aortoiliac occlusion and to uh, do bilateral common femoral endarterectomies um, at the same time. And I did ask my partner, uh, Josh Adams, to do the case with me. So. Uh, of course, one side is always easier to cross, and we got through the left side uh, pretty rapidly. We were able to take our initial aortogram, um, just reconfirming what the CT scan had showed us with uh, significant stenosis in the distal, about three and a half centimeters of the aorta with an occlusion into both iliacs. The uh, left side, or excuse me, the right side proved much more difficult to re-enter, and uh, after a good deal of time spent trying to um, you just use wire and catheter to re-enter in the um, distal aorta, we uh, chose to use a wire and snare technique that, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, but we, uh, we were able to come over from the left to the right and use a wire and snare technique to gain through and through access, and then uh, utilized a uh, six millimeter um, balloon to essentially angioplasty through the bilateral common iliacs and across the bifurcation in order to um, open up all any uh, fenestrations that were there to provide um, improved access. And uh, at this time, we then introduced an endologix graft that was a 22 millimeters in diameter. And uh, because she did have a significant portion of healthy um, inframenal aorta, we chose to use a short uh, main body segment of 40 millimeters with 40 millimeters on each iliac limb as well. And in order to protect the area of the uh, left common iliac, well, both common iliacs that we had uh, just crossed, we chose to advance a sheath all the way up into the bifurcation and then pull the, sh the uh, endologics device down into the sheath, sheath on that left side um, prior to deployment. Um, our uh, run uh, demonstrated that right side, which, also, which had initially been so difficult to cross, opened up quite nicely, but the left side remained stenosed in that distal common iliac. Uh, so at that time, we chose to uh, angioplasty it, which did lead to some uh, dissection into the internal iliac, uh, which was treated with an eye cast stent and subsequently a balloon angioplasty of that internal iliac in order to uh, restore um, or to eliminate the flow limiting stenosis from that dissection. And so uh, patient was um, 
recovered uh, for about two days in the hospital, went home without any difficulties, had regained um, palpable pulses in her feet. Um, and uh, we chose to have her go home on aspirin and Plavix in addition to her uh, statin and blood pressure medications. Uh, at her one month follow up, um, she had uh, no claudication, continued to have palpable pulses in her feet, um, and at this time uh, had actually gone back to work already and was back to being active with her grandchildren. And this is just a, a brief image of her um, CT scan at one month uh, demonstrating uh, appropriate um, patency of the endograft and the distal aorta into both limbs and the iliac, that left iliac has um, remained patent with the ICAST stent supporting it and the uh, dissection into the internal iliac had healed. So um, when I had first uh, considered or asked to be to present this case, I was thinking about going through some adjunct techniques for you know going through the um, occlusions. Although uh, realistically, um, probably everybody in this room already knows that. <laughs> so uh, you know we we tried to focus on getting through and through access in order to allow us to uh, utilize balloon angioplasty. Uh, certainly, utilizing brachial artery access is sometimes effective in order to do that if you're not able to go from both femorals. And uh, throughout the case, we did talk about utilizing an Outback or Pioneer catheter um, in the iliac in that iliac and aortic segment, we chose not to do so for the risk of um, that needle not quite being long enough to get us re-entered. But certainly, that's another uh, very effective device, especially with uh, the Pioneer with the use of the um, IVUS on the on the re-entry device itself. Um, I thought really the the more interesting question for this patient is whether or not this was uh, you know the appropriate treatment for her. Um, we certainly talk a lot about. Um, high-risk patients versus great operative candidates. This was a thin, otherwise healthy, active woman who had a, an aortic occlusion that was distal and certainly could have been a very good open aorta bifemoral candidate. Um, and the studies looking at task C and D lesions initially focused on patients who were poor surgical candidates, such as the um, Brevissimo trial in 2013, of course, they looked at C and D lesions and found that they had very good one-year patency with kissing iliac stents in C and D lesions at 90% uh, respectively, or 90% at one year. And then, of course, the COBEST trial also looked at task C and D lesions and found um, an 84% freedom from restenosis at 18 months. And uh, some work from um, Europe, where unfortunately we don't have some of this uh, technology here in the United States, but really rebuilding the aortic bifurcation entirely endovascularly has also demonstrated uh, very good results in both task C and D lesions uh, for patients um, with minimal hospital stay and minimal uh, morbidity. Um, one of the, I think some of the advantages of using an endograft in this case is that it uh, does allow you to remain less invasive from an aorta bifemoral bypass. And um, in her case especially, it really does not preclude a future aortic intervention should she have a difficulty because we still have a, a segment of untreated um, infrarenal aorta. Um, and it really eliminates that flow competition in the distal narrow aorta with her eccentric um, stenosis at the distal aorta. Trying to uh, fit two ICAST stents in there and not have competitive flow uh, would have really been difficult and potentially led to uh, uh, short-term restenosis for this patient. And again, uh, that uh, uh, basically eliminating that radial mismatch at the bifurcation. Um, when choosing an endograft, there's been you know some publications, uh, although few and far between, regarding um, endograft use for aortoiliac occlusive disease using various grafts. And so uh, some considerations in the distal aorta include the risk of infolding of the graft, as well as um, compression of either iliac limb and the ability to provide support through that uh, limb extension. And, and the ability to extend it down further into the common iliac if needed. Um, and then the uh, using low profile systems that have a small delivery system. Um, in, the, in one study uh, looking at long term patency at eight years for endograft use for aorta iliac disease, they uh, found a primary patency of 86% and a secondary patency of 100%. So um, in conclusion, I think that this was a really, uh, it was a great case for me, great learning experience. I think this patient has done very well, and um, I appreciate any comments about our, our choices to how we cared for her. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie, for this great case. Uh, Frank, you have, with your team, pioneered the use of stent grafts in occlusive disease at Montefiore. I would like your comments, please. Well, first of all, this is a great case and nice review of the literature, but we have actually a series of papers 
on uh, treating aortoiliac occlusions going back prehistorically to 1993, 4, and 5, and a subsequent one in 1998 with long-term follow-up. We did about 70 or 80 cases of uh, complex aortoiliac occlusions with our own homemade graft because we could get the stents and we could get the Gore-Tex and we sewed them together and did these cases and we had some unbelievably great results. We also had some problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the problems is that we, if one of the grafts closed and we covered the hypogastric, uh, which occasionally we did, uh, or most of the time we did, because we, we did an endovascular anastomosis at the common femoral level, so we, we excluded the hypogastric. So they got really bad ischemia when they failed. That's one problem. The second problem is, and there have been a number of uh, reports by Molina and by the, the group in, I think it's Holland, uh, Renan and, and, and uh, Gaverti, where they, they do, uh, they, they make a, a bifurcation with covered stents and they mm -hmm. go all the way up to the aorta, but the, uh, to the renals. But the problem is that if you release embolic material, and we showed this in another paper, you get retrograde embolization if, the, if there uh, is occlusion of the common iliacs because the blood goes down and it swirls back up into the uh, SMA and the renal. So if you're doing a juxtarenal aortic occlusion, which can be done, you must have balloons or stents uh, or something in the renals to, to protect them and the SMA, or you get retrograde embolization. I, I think you did, yours was a more distal yes, sir. occlusion, mm -hmm. and you didn't get it, but you can get really dramatic retrograde embolization, and that, that's one of the um, precautions with this kind of procedure. So I, I think it was, it's a brilliant case, but there is, there is precedence and, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a nice literature which you reviewed that shows that it can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, should it be done all the time? I don't know. You can have, we have debates next year at our meeting in New York, some saying you should use endo on all cases, others saying that some of them should have open surgery. It's a very nice case. Nice job. Um, very elegant in terms of the way you got uh, access across the uh, bifurcation with the snare. Uh, I, I guess one question I have is uh, why not just use good old-fashioned Palmas stents and just open up the distal commons and the distal aorta? I think that uh, that may be a technique that's uh, a little bit lost, but you get great radial force. Uh, she side's not a problem here because of uh, you have femoral access that's open, correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious, did you consider just just standard stenting instead of putting an endograft in? Because I think the problem with endografting is you do have radial force issues. Uh, and so you end up putting a stent in anyways, like you did on the right side. So. Just curious mm -hmm. if you considered that. Sure. Um, admittedly, I, I did not uh, think about just using a palm moss dent and then putting any um, additional, uh, you know, ICAST stents in to uh, rebuild the bifurcation at that time. Um, certainly, similar to the some of the research there, though, that's I'm aware of that being a described technique to have a kind of three stent segment to rebuild the bifurcation there. But in this case, I did not consider that. Mm -hmm. There's one other point. Tom Maldonado from NYU, one of my partners, is actually doing a collection. Uh, of use of endologic graft for aortoiliac disease, mm -hmm. and and I think they're supported by the company and mm -hmm. so forth. So, it'd be very nice for you to uh, share this case with them, and maybe be a part of that. He's done, I think, three of himself already using endologics for occlusive disease, and and it's an original idea, mm -hmm. and you might join him on that. Yes, thank you, sir. I saw some of his data from the uh, from his presentation. I thought it was very very nice work. Actually, nice we have done a couple more mm -hmm. at MUSC before, and so far they seems to be doing well. Any other comments, please? So just just a question about your mm -hmm. technique. But the the challenge we've had with that particular device is pulling the contralateral limb down through a diseased iliac. So your your idea of putting a sheath up and pulling that contralateral limb into the sheath was was really a nice way to to get around that challenge. That's a 0.014 inch wire that comes down from the contralateral limb. How did you get a big sheath up 
through that disease left common iliac. I, I think that I uh, uh, neglected to comment that we did use balloon angioplasty in each common iliac after we had gained access into the aorta so that we had created space in, in preparation for placing that sheath. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think all these cases were, as I think Frank said, uh, brilliant. I, I, I want to pull the uh, monetary elephant into the room here for a minute. Um, and the reason I want to do that, it, about six weeks ago, I saw a woman that Chris Kowalik in Boston um, had done a complex endovascular procedure on. And she had moved to Charleston because um, she had to sell her house to pay part of the bill. And she still had a residual bill of $50,000. And she moved down to Charleston, staying with her mother. I don't know that we have data on how many patients we do these really elegant procedures on who in the end have hospital bills, because insurance doesn't cover it all, that have financially devastated these people. My understanding is the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country right now are unpaid medical bills. And I guess I would just ask this group who's doing a lot of this, we need to look. We, we, we have the outcome patency, we have the outcome living. We, I've never seen any data, economic data, on what happens to these patients who have these very complex very expensive procedures, and I think we need to start looking at that. Jim, I totally agree with you, but we are facing a patient, a patient with a problem. I think that what we need is to fix the problem with the healthcare insurance, that, you know, they like to get the money, but they are not willing to cover people for their healthcare problems. So, you know, we are, we are doctors. I understand your concern. I'm very concerned about costs, and we discuss on a daily basis. But whenever we face a patient with a problem, we, and you know this very well, we, we try to help the patient. So what we need to do is to fix the health care insurance problems that we have. One of the advantages of our original surgeon-made graft cost a couple hundred bucks. We had a Gore-Tex, piece of Gore-Tex and a 308 Palmer stent. And, and some plastic straws we got from, uh, from other containers for guide wires. It cost us, I think, almost nothing, a couple hundred dollars. But the, I think the, the industry-made graphs are better, work better, and, and uh, have less complications. We can do it very cheaply. Yes. I uh, want to make one last comment just to um, put in a plug with some of the people in the room. When uh, you mentioned just stenting the iliacs, and this is just a point of having to deal with some of these patients when they're referred to tertiary care medical centers after they've had simple stenting of the common iliacs. Um, one of the things that's really important is that it, it, my prejudice is that we use balloon expandable stents in the common iliacs and not self expanding stents. Um, self expanding stents really limit what we can do in the future as far as opening up whether we're using endografts or, or other types of, of covered balloon expandable stents and things like that. So I think it's really important. That's one of the, the self-expanding stents in the common iliac artery is one of the few things that I think really pushes us more towards an open repair in some of those patients rather than um, being able to do some kind of salvage endovascular procedure. So I just wanted to take the opportunity with the, the folks in the room who might be doing um, some iliac stenting in their practice. And I'd, I'd just like to add about PAMA stenting. That's balloon expandable, and the best patencies published are common iliac balloon expandable stenting for endovascular procedures in general. That is the best. And probably it's one of the cheapest stents on the market. Uh, it's, and it may be a lost art for some of the younger vascular surgeons to crimp that on a balloon, load it into a sheath, and then bring it up and then pull the sheath back and expand it. So, so uh, I think Dr. Hallett's points are very, very good ones. We can spend, you know, $30,000 on an endograft, or we can put in three PAMA stents and get essentially the same, same, the same thing. We, we really have to continue to consider cost and different options. Just because we have new tools and we can use them that are more expensive doesn't mean the old things don't work as well. So again, very nice case, very elegant, uh, but brings up very good discussions about uh, uh, the different options to treat the same problem that we've been faced with. Thank you.